Hey guys, today we're checking out the HP Spectre X360, but before we start, I have a quick introduction on HP and the Spectre lineup. If you came up to me and asked me about HP laptops sometime years ago, I would have told you to look elsewhere. With reason, I was under the impression that they weren't the most performant laptops you could get at the time, and even if they were powerful and performant, they were too huge and too thick. Today, my impression of HP is changing quite a bit. Their laptops are looking a lot nicer and are packing more of a punch. The HP Spectre X360 is a really attractive device, made by HP of course, but co-designed by Microsoft. In my opinion, the overall user experience is pretty much the same throughout most models in the Spectre lineup. The only differences between models would have to be the internals and minor design changes. But considering what these laptops are here to do, internals shouldn't matter. You'll find out why in a bit. This review unit is an HP Spectre X360 13T4000. It's powered by an Intel Core i5 with 8GB of RAM and a 128GB SSD. This model is quite dated and rocks a low tier configuration, but it's running great and is serving me very well. If a newer model of the same laptop were to be configured similarly, the newer model would of course be faster than my review unit, but like I said, the overall user experience will be reasonably indifferent. This laptop is very well built. You have a nice, smooth aluminum finish everywhere. The build quality is top notch, both the top component and the keyboard have very little flex, and the overall presentation of this laptop is nice. It looks like a professional laptop and some people will definitely find this laptop very attractive. The entire design is unique and the aesthetics are undeniably satisfying. You won't find something like this on any other laptop, at least for now. But does it perform like a professional laptop? We'll have to see about that. Looking around the device, you get a decent amount of ports. On the left side, you have one USB 3.0 port, an oddly placed power button, and an SD card slot. SD cards sit very flush when inserted into the laptop, which most people are going to appreciate a lot. On the right, you have two more USB 3 ports, an HDMI port, a mini display port, volume rockers, and a Windows button. That Windows button is for use when you're in tablet mode. Going back to the left side, you'll see a vent for expelling air, then flip the laptop over and you'll see an air intake vent, and two downfiring speakers. The main feature of this laptop is its hinge. This is a 2-in-1 hybrid laptop, specifically a convertible. As the name of this laptop may suggest, the hinge can rotate 360 degrees, allowing for four different setups to satisfy your hybrid computer needs. Setup 1, Laptop Mode. Nothing special here, but you got a touchscreen and support for pen input, so that may boost your productivity up a bit. The fully rotating hinge may come in handy on occasion. Setup 2, Presentation Mode. A mode somewhat similar to the act of flipping the tablet component around on the Microsoft Surface Book. The only difference is that it's much easier to get to that presentation type layout thanks to the fully rotating hinge. No detaching parts or difficulty with handling. This mode is good for watching videos on your bed or for use as a monitoring display during, let's say, a PowerPoint presentation. Setup 3. Tent mode. A mode that stands the laptop up like a tent. If you don't plan on getting the HP Active Stylus, then you're most likely going to use this layout for watching videos during a flight or a car ride. If you do plan on getting the HP Active Stylus, then this mode is going to be extremely useful for annotating stuff. I wouldn't say drawing would be good in tent mode, nor presentation mode for that matter, because as most of you artists know, sometimes we can get a little vigorous when lining a sketch. You'll press really hard on the screen and all of a sudden, the laptop will collapse on you or get moved into a position that might make your life difficult. So, again, drawing. Tent mode is not good for drawing, but tent mode can be great for other stuff, like watching movies or doing some careful annotating. Setup 4, Tablet Mode, a mode that converts the laptop into a tablet. Now, guys who want an HP Active Stylus, this is the mode you'll be using for any serious artistic or graphical work. Unless you get a separate drawing tablet, this is the only setup you'll be using in order to do artistic work comfortably. For everyone else, this tablet mode is simply there for your convenience. Some people will have reason to use the device in tablet mode, but you won't be using it 24-7. Using this convertible as a tablet and doing activities an average consumer would do isn't going to be the most ergonomically comfortable. It's pretty heavy and the outermost gap created as a result of this setup will dig into your hand. For some people, this might hurt a little bit. I don't think HP intended to make this gap a grip or a resting place for your fingers, but it's there. If you can make it work ergonomically, maybe this gap won't be such an issue. Continuing on, the keyboard is pretty nice. Like I said already, there's little to no flex on this keyboard. The keys feel decent when pressed on and the font isn't totally out of this world. Overall, it's a durable keyboard that looks great and feels good. Although, there are two critical things you should know. 
One, if you're used to keyboards with less key travel distance, then getting used to this keyboard will take a while. Two, this is a laptop that adopted the infamous compact up and down arrow keys. So you'll find yourself pressing the shift key instead of the up key, even if you think you're used to these arrow key placements. This keyboard is backlit with only one level of backlighting that isn't too bright. It either works or doesn't help you at all. One of the keys function as a backlighting toggle, which is always going to be lit whether your entire keyboard has backlighting on or off. Some people might find it annoying. This is what I'm talking about. I might add that the keyboard is deactivated once the display is rotated a little bit beyond 180 degrees, which means you don't have to worry about accidental keystroke inputs when you're in those three modes. Unfortunately though, this won't make tablet mode a very comfortable experience. The trackpad is a completely different beast. It's a wide precision trackpad, good for trackpad gestures, and that's it. The surface of the trackpad is textured, and I would argue that it's not the best feeling in the world. Additionally, tracking isn't always accurate, and on another note, reaching the bottom right corner for a right click is really hard. Some of you will want to use an optical mouse with this laptop. I would have loved using gestures on this super wide precision trackpad, but the trackpad is at times unresponsive with small pinky fingers, so tap-based gestures may be a hit or miss. Overall, I'm not a huge fan of the super wide trackpad. Bigger isn't always better, so I would have asked for something a little bit smaller. However, a lot of people are all about these crazy wide precision trackpads. So if large trackpads are your thing, then I would assume that you'll love this giant trackpad and probably dismiss all of its flaws. To get an idea of how big it actually is, it's about the size of an iPhone 6. This laptop has a really nice display. It's a touchscreen display with a full HD IPS panel, rocking a maximum screen resolution of 1920 by 1080 you have the option to get a configuration with a QHD display, which is a touchscreen 2560 by 1440 IPS panel, but since it's rocking Intel HD graphics 5500 with only one gigabyte of video memory, you're better off getting the 1080p configuration. Viewing angles are great. You won't see any fading when viewing at an irregular angle. Brightness and color accuracy are fine too. You won't have to worry about it. The screen wobbles a little bit when you physically tap on the display, but it's nothing to be afraid of. The bezels are a little bit thicker than I would have liked them to be. When you put proportions into consideration, you may notice with this particular model that bezels are thick alongside this 13 inch display. Some people won't mind though. Alright, this is how the webcam looks and how the microphone sounds. On newer models, the video quality is a teeny bit better and the audio quality isn't going to be as low quality as this one. But really, what kind of webcams are average consumers going to need? This should suffice for express video calls. You get 1080p video at 14 frames per second. Of course, cheaper models of this laptop will have webcams similar to this one, and newer models will have better frame rates, but arguably the same video quality. Now let's talk about video editing. If you're going to edit RAW with any compatible video editing software like Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve, I wouldn't even try. It's going to completely fry the CPU. You can edit standard and full HD videos just fine though. Regardless of frame rate, the performance is there for light editing. Anything above 2560 by 1440 will cost you many tedious hours of patience. When video editing, CPU throttling does take place and it's extremely noticeable when rendering videos. This will make video editing very painful for a lot of people, but in general, light to moderate video editing is totally possible. You just need to be a bit patient and you've got to make sure you're not overworking the laptop with heavy post-production activity. This computer is beyond acceptable for programming, and that's really all I have to say for this category. I use Visual Studio 2015 and one of the things I do with it is build responsive HTML5 websites. This laptop is decent enough to get some serious coding done. The display's 16 to 9 screen ratio is alright. You could argue that the display is lacking the height for a comfortable view of your code, but you'll get used to it easily. Other than that, the experience is great. No major complaints here. Gaming isn't great on this device, and before I continue with that, just know that this laptop isn't advertised to be a gaming or video editing machine, if it isn't obvious already. However, people are going to want to try it anyway. Overwatch, a moderately graphics demanding game, is barely standing well on medium settings with standard HD 1280x720 as the recommended resolution for playing. At the very, very least, you'll get 22 frames per second. Newer and more graphics intensive MMORPGs, like Riders of Icarus, are going to run very well on low settings, but can drop to the 20s on medium high settings. 
I don't play AAA titles that much, so I don't have any great footage for you guys. However, keep in mind that AAA titles will give you single digits on this laptop. This should be a given. I would say just build a desktop PC or get a dedicated gaming laptop for these kinds of games. Since this laptop supports pen input, I want to talk about drawing really quick. If you want a laptop that's great for artistic work, then this is not the device for you. I'll say that right now. It's great for annotating and light markups on PDFs, OneNote, the Mark a Web Note feature on Microsoft Edge, but nothing else. If you want to do some real artistic work, go for a different computer. The HP Active Stylus, the pen that is supported by these notebooks, are pretty underperforming. It only supports up to 255 levels of pressure sensitivity, doesn't have an eraser, rocks a right-click button that can't be reprogrammed, and lacks support for precision pen input. For the third time, this laptop is not for art. Battery life isn't bad, it's decent. If you manage to pull off gaming with this laptop, I presume that you will get, at its very maximum, 2.5 hours of battery life at 80% brightness. My father uses an HP Spectre X360. On standby with occasional light usage, he says that he can get through more than a day of battery life, easily. Furthermore, continuous usage on battery will last him about 5 hours. So with that in mind, what kind of battery life do I get with this laptop? With a brightness set to 80%, the device went from 100% to 15% battery life in 4 hours and 37 minutes of uninterrupted continuous use. During that time, I used the Windows 10 Mail app, watched YouTube videos through Microsoft Edge, recorded the narration used for this video, typed up notes on OneNote, and a few other small things. So I got a lot of things done during the span of time. At the same brightness level, I proceeded in depleting the battery from 100% to around 15% multiple times to see if battery life kept hitting 4 hours and a half. However, that wasn't the case. Under light to moderate usage, you can get yourself anywhere near 3.5 and 5.5 hours of battery life with this laptop. That's not bad for a lot of people. Now, let's add standby time to this data. You can easily hit a day or two on battery if you manage your time on this laptop wisely. Writing an essay for a couple of hours brought me from 100% to 89% battery. After leaving the laptop in sleep mode overnight, I woke up with 87% battery and just enough to get through a fairly basic school day. So again, battery life isn't bad. It's decent, but 4 hours of battery life isn't going to cut it for some people. Alright, now why would you want to get the HP Spectre X360 compared to the competition? This is a laptop that targets your productivity, like most present day Ultrabooks. However, it's unique in the sense that it has a fully rotatable hinge and is more enticing than most laptops when you put its build quality into consideration. Overall, it's a very honorable laptop. You have a professional looking machine with a good amount of parts, of course it's fully rotatable hinge, a well-built keyboard, a huge trackpad, a top tier display that supports pen and touch, and an option to configure the device's specifications before you buy it. You'll want to get this laptop if you're looking for a laptop with good looks, good performance for the typical everyday PC user, and the ability to provide a decent experience. On the other hand, you shouldn't want to get this laptop just for its hinge. I know that sounds a bit contradictory, but what I'm saying is, this hinge should not be the determinant in your decision to get this laptop. Sure, the fully rotatable hinge can be really helpful in a vast amount of situations, but you won't be using tent mode, presentation mode, and tablet mode all the time. If you end up never using the hinge at its full advantage, it'll turn out to be just a gimmick to you, just an ignored feature of this ultrabook that you will never use regularly. So that's why you shouldn't buy this laptop just for its hinge. It should be thought of as a convenience and nothing else. Unfortunately, you'll have to pay a bit of a price premium to get a laptop like this. Lower tier configurations are around $600 to $800 nowadays, and higher tier configurations have a chance of dipping into the thousands, which is a bit pricey for what it is. But hey, you get a nice bang for your buck, and it could turn out to be of great use to you. Of course, with a price point like this, people on a crazy low budget, under $300 let's say, is not supposed to be the target audience for this laptop. This laptop is good for the average everyday PC user, programmers, definitely, and content creators that won't be doing extremely heavy work. But if someone on a crazy low budget comes up to me and tells me, I don't need a powerful machine, but I want something that won't freeze and won't underperform like other cheap computers, then I'll most likely tell them, just save your money and get something that will actually live up to that kind of expectation. One option being this HP Spectre X360. I hope you guys enjoyed my review. If you liked it, drop a like. 
If you loved it, I'd love a sub too. My time is up, so I'll see you guys again in my next video.